It's story time, kids. Today, we're going to read The Call of Cthulhu for Beginning Readers by R.J. Ivanovic. As you can see, it's kind of modeled after Dr. Seuss. So I'm going to go here, and we're going to start with the horror in clay. The most merciful thing in the world, I believe, is humanity's failure to fully conceive of the ho cosmical horrors we've yet to reveal and which up until now I have tried to conceal. Back in late 26, when my great uncle died, I discovered the research he wanted to hide. Over time, he'd uncovered much more than he should. He'd have kept it all secret if only he could. But Professor George Engel has met with his fate and exactly what killed him has caused some debate. The physicians have claimed there's no reason to doubt that his lengthy walk home caused his heart to give out. The more sinister truth I have heard people say he was shoved by a sailor who stood in his way. And my poor Uncle George, he was really too old to survive such a bump on a hill in the cold. Shortly after his death on that hill by the sea, the professor's belongings were given to me. I was sorting through all of his research one day when I found a monstrosity made out of clay. It was carved by a sculptor named Wilcox one night when more sensitive folk endured horrible sights. The young sculptor was puzzled by what he had made by the script and the creature his carving displayed. So he sought out an expert who'd know that they meant, who'd explain his mad vision and where his mind went. It was fortunate that brought it was fortune that brought him to Angle's door. You see, Angle had seen such a creature before. The professor urged Wilcox to try and recall all the things he had dreamed of, no matter how small. When the sculptor then coughed up the sounds he had heard, it confirmed something quite na supernatural occurred. Cthulhu Dargan. The professor re requested a journal be kept that the sculptor would could update each night that he slept. And the dreamer recorded all the things he had seen for the whole month of March with his nightly routine. But on April the 2nd, her diary stopped when into unconsciousness Wilcox had dropped. I believed was probably some kind of hoax that my uncle fell victim to Wilcox's jokes. For a time I was willing to let it all pass until later I read of Inspector Legrasse. Part two, the tale of Inspector Legrasse. When Legrasse met with experts who liked to explore, he presented a thing they had not seen before. He was looking for answers, but got none at all until Webb raised his hand at the back of the hall. He had seen something like it a long time ago. It was worshiped in Greenland by strange Eskimo. He described how they danced and repeated their cries, which Legrasse recognized to the expert's surprise. He went on to reveal where his knowledge was gained. He'd encountered a cult, the inspector explained. They had told him the meaning of the words they'd been screaming. In his house at Riley, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. In a New Orleans swamp less than one year before, he had broken that cult in the name of the law. When some people who lived near that swamp disappeared, the police had been called and the worst had been feared. The policemen took care to avoid certain trails as the locals that had told them some terrible tales. They had warned of a lake in its polypus thing to which cultists at midnight would crazily sing. When Legrasse and his men had uncovered the place, they discovered the worst of the whole human race. The policemen had paused to recover their breath. All the kidnapping victims had been put to death. Fingli Mglavweth Cthulhu Riley Ugnal Fatagin. When the cult was locked up by the end of the day, the police had to know why they'd acted that way. When a cultist named Castro had spoken with glee when describing a city lost under the sea. <clears throat> Great Cthulhu once led them across outer space when they flew here from some very far away place. They slept for millennia, Castro had said, but their dreaming confirms that they're really not dead. When that city named Riley comes up from the deep, when Cthulhu will stir 
and give up his sleep. You find mention of this if you dare to look inside Abdul Azared's mysterious book. I will quote here verbatim for those who don't know what the Mad Arab wrote such a long time ago. There is nothing that's dead which eternal can lie, because it gives strange, because give it strange aeons, and death may yet die. So Cthulhu's cult study the skies every night, knowing Raleigh will rise when the stars are just right. All the experts in Engel had taken an oath not to speak of that cult, nor encourage its growth. With the mad implications of what they had heard, they would research in secret and not say a word. It was hard to believe all the things I had read. I still doubted a lot of Wilcox had said, of what Wilcox had said. I had, lot that, uh, I had thought that perhaps the young skelter had heard of that dark southern swamp and the crime that had occurred. So for my own peace of mind, I just had to be sure that I wasn't a prank, that it wasn't something more. When I'd spoken to Wilcox, he made it quite clear that something, that Call of Cthulhu was something to fear. Then I went to see Castro, but Castro was dead. So I stopped in to see the inspector instead. When I spoke to Legrasse, I was lucky to find that he still had the cult in the back of his mind. I started to think it would make my career if I published this stuff for the whole world to hear. Part three. The Madness from the Sea. I was studying rocks from all over the world when a sheet of newsprint from Sydney unfurled. On that faded old page, a forgotten report told the tale of a schooner whose trip was cut short. Of eleven crew members, ten failed to return, and the loss of the Emma had caused some concern. After meeting a yacht which had ordered them back, it appears that the Emma fell under attack. The Emma was sunk. There was nothing to do but seize the alert and abandon her crew. Two weeks later in Sydney, a sailor arrived, but no other crewman from the Emma survived. The report said John Johansson returned from the sea with an idol in hand quite mysteriously. On the fate of his crew, he'd refused to say more than they died on an island they'd stopped to explore. The events had occurred on the same very week that young Wilcox's nightmares had been at their peak. So I tracked down Johansson to hear what he'd say through New Zealand and Sydney and lastly Norway. When Miss, Mrs. Johansson had come to the door, she'd explained that he'd died just a few months before. He had never revealed what had happened at sea, so she took out his logbook and gave it. He had written in English to help spare his wife from the terrible knowledge that had ruined his life. The book he described, the strange place he had seen, and I knew that to Riley, the sailor, had been. When the crew went ashore, they discovered a stair, so they climbed, climbed to the top just to see what was there. Then Johansson described how a door opened wide and they heard something in the darkness stir inside. He recalled that they froze and that nobody spoke. So intense was their fear when... Cthulhu awoke. When Johansson and Bryden returned to the sea, they had jumped in their boat in an effort to flee. As Johansson prepared to escape in the yacht, he discovered the boiler was not very hot. When the sailors had learned that Cthulhu could swim, poor Brighton went mad and the future looked grim. The alert started moving, but not very fast, and the creature drew closer with each, mo with each moment that passed. There was nothing to do but to steer with the wheel till Cthulhu's huge head was lined up with the keel. When the yacht pierced Cthulhu between his great eyes, the alert that survived to Johansson's surprise at the end of the logbook, I fearfully read that the monster was sighted repairing his head. By the time they were re rescued, poor Bryden had died, and Johansson was sitting with his eyes open wide when the rescue ship Villagent sailed past the spot where the city once was, but by then it was not. I assumed that Cthulhu had reached his great sleep and the heart of a city way down in the deep. I discovered the sender of Wilcox's dreams, and I'm certain there's more to the cult than it seems. But the knowledge is more than just one man can take, and in knowing, I fear that my mind will soon break. 
I soon have told you these. Now I have told you these things so that you'll understand why I'm sealing them up just as anger would plan. Just remember the cultists are out there somewhere keeping track of the secrets they don't want to share. Found among the papers, the late Francis Whalen, Thurston of Boston. The most merciful thing in the world, I believe, is humanity's failure to fully conceive of the cosmical horrors we've yet to reveal and which up until now I've tried to conceal.